centers in, in New York or creating um, areas of specialty like ad tech, for example, or MarTech, there tend to be high concentration in New York. Um, but there is no shortage of talent and companies in the New York area. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in an incubator because it's like 100 degrees in our <laughs> So um, where, where were most of your clients coming from at the start? I mean, were they, you, you, know, you most, have a sweet spot. So, so most of my clients actually came initially from my personal network, which really had been in telecom and video conferencing. Um, uh, some cyber security mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had been uh, working obviously in Israel in Israel and with Israeli high-tech companies so the initial start was a lot of those connections but then as those folks moved on to other companies and our network grew and our reputation grew um, we really started branching out into um, supply chain and logistics we do a lot of work in that space uh, a lot of big data um, we're also doing a lot in uh, marketing technology and mm -hmm. um, software as a service. Uh, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, we really started going um, hard on blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, we've done a lot of work in that space. We still do. Um, and now, you know, we've moved into healthcare, health and wellness. Um, and from a geographic perspective, our clients really don't have a geographic concentration. Right. So we have clients as far away as India as as close as around the corner from our office. So mm -hmm. the location has never been an impediment to, to the good work that we're able to do for them. So I, I had a very short stint covering technology and I um, tell me a little bit about the Israeli tech scene because I always was, was fascinated that, that it was just such a, what seemed like an exploding tech scene in like the mid Ops. There just seemed to be so many tech companies in Israel, and it was really, I mean, it really kind of jumped off the page. Yeah, it's, it, first of all, it's something that I think is very ingrained in Israeli culture. So I did, I moved there when I was 18. I actually wound up finishing my college degree there, and I was in the military there, and that has a big impact on, I think, the psyche of most Israelis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is uh, an incredible country with uh, fantastic educational programs, great institutions of learning, uh, but there also is something in Israeli culture around being very um, open to risk and not afraid of failure and having an incredible confidence and uh, belief in oneself and your ability. And part of that I do believe is due to the military um, and the training that people get and especially if they're fortunate enough to be in uh, whether it's an intelligence unit or a technical unit where they're learning really cutting edge technology skills and many of them then take that into civilian life and transfer that into developing companies of their own. Um, but I also think it's uh, uh, this spirit that kind of permeates the entire society of you know survival. Um, we'll do whatever it takes, we'll hustle, we'll roll up our sleeves, we'll figure it out. Um, and a fearlessness that you really need as an entrepreneur and you really need in the tech world. Mm -hmm. um, so there is as much, I think, celebration and embracing of spectacular failures um, as there is of incredible success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you really need that from a startup perspective. Interesting. So you're a, you're a player in the space in New York. So what was your reaction to Amazon picking New York for HQ2 or one of the HQ, HQ2 one half, whatever you want to call it, right? And then pulling out. I mean, what was your initial reaction there? Uh, you know, it's um, on the one hand, I mean, I I feel like I am responsible for Amazon stock rising <laughs> personally based okay. on the number of boxes that come to my house. Um, I dread, uh, going shopping so anytime i can click to buy i'm all for it you know i think that um i would just think from a business perspective having a hub of that size in new york would make sense knowing that you have you know nine million people in yeah. manhattan and another you know another nine to ten million just in the outskirts so i can certainly uh, understand why amazon would do it and you have an endless supply of potential employees um, but I also understand from a community standpoint some of the frustration with um, you know the tax benefits that were being offered and the discounts and 
Uh, you know, Amazon has certainly hurt many traditional businesses and mom and pop stores and some concern over that. So mm -hmm. I, I feel for both, but I do think that, um, you know, big business is critical for New York. Um, companies like Amazon or Google or, you know, any of these major giants coming into this area is just going to be a, a net positive for the economy overall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... My first reaction to it was that I, I'm, I'm a Mets fan, unfortunately, so I take the 7 train through Long Island City all the time, and, and you look at that neighborhood, and it's just, in the past five years, it's just changed unbelievably mm -hmm. from what used to be like this series of small buildings and, and, you know, really interesting street art and graffiti and things like that to a lot of high-rises now. And you know, you when you read about real estate, they're like, oh, you know, Sunnyside is next mm -hmm. in this neighborhood, and, and Queens is next, and it gives you this sense of Hang on, you know, people live there. Yeah. So, you know, you could understand the frustration as well, too, I think. Okay, um, that's that's really interesting. So what do you, when you think about the tech sector right now, I mean, there's a lot of reputational issues. There's a lot of uh, credibility issues, for lack of a better term, when you, you think about data security, data use, data sharing, things like that. I mean, what's what's your 10,000-foot view on it in, in terms of what does this industry have to do better? to regain people's trust, whether it's Facebook or Google or anything like that? You know, it's it's so interesting because I think um, in many ways, the public has become immune to some of this. So yes, people are up in arms and you see all of these articles about Facebook and privacy, but yet there hasn't been a major pullout of use. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think what has happened is a lot of this technology has become so much part of our everyday lives that it's hard for people to change their behavior mm -hmm. um, just based on these security concerns. In fact, with one of our clients a few years ago, um, we did a, a survey um, and the survey asked folks if they were using some of the security measures that were available to them on apps like two-step authentication or fingerprint, biometric um, you know, security, and Many of them said, I would, but it's too annoying or it's too frustrating or, you know, I know that it's safer, but I'm not using it because I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to wait that extra half a second it will take to kind of put in the password. And we also asked questions about, you know, are you giving away your information, you know, to sites that you know are not secure or even when you get a pop-up message, you know, from your browser that says this is not a secure site or not a trusted site. And the answers that we got were like 36% of people would compromise their personal data in order to get a free app or in order to download a song that they liked or, in, you know, they'll risk it. Mm. So I think you have this combination of consumer behavior and corporate responsibility. And as long as consumers are still willing participants in allowing their data to be stolen or misused, uh, there's just not going to be enough pressure on these companies to right. make the changes that they need. Right. Um, it's only, I think, really when they start to feel it in their wallets, mm -hmm. and that means less use, less advertisers, less eyeballs, uh, in order for them to make real change. What, what about regulatory challenges, too? I mean, you know, Elizabeth Warren is using them as a punching bag in the early days of her campaign. I mean, there are a lot of people on both sides that mm -hmm. think that there needs to be a crackdown in one way or the other on, on big tech. I mean, do you think they that's their biggest worry? I do think that uh, the regulatory challenges are a big fear. I mean, GDPR in Europe mm -hmm. was a huge leap in terms of protecting uh, individual privacy. It had tremendous impact on tech globally because if you were operating anywhere in Europe, you were touched by this. Mm -hmm. So many companies took those uh, requirements or in order to be in compliance in Europe and applied it to their um, operations worldwide. So I do think it is a major concern. Mm -hmm. um, also, so many tech companies, especially in the last decade, have grown up with offering free services in exchange for selling, using, appropriating your data in some way for their um, you know, business model. Right. And if you take away that option, someone is going to have to pay for those services and most likely will also be the consumer. So I think there's going to be a, you know, this balancing of the scales between we want regulation, but I don't want to pay for Facebook. Sure. 
Sure. Interesting. Okay, what's your favorite app? My favorite app? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm obsessed with certain, like, fitness apps okay. right now. So I have, like, 22 different apps on my phone. Um, everything from, like, seven-minute workout to, like, carb counters. Um, I also, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed with podcasts as okay. well, I will say. Um, of course, PR Week. We, we, we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you'll get plenty of softball questions. But I love those. Uh, I love the crime podcast. My current obsession right now is The Root of Evil. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about that one. I haven't heard about that one. Um, it's, it, there's actually a, a TV show that it's tied to on TNT called I Am the Night. Yeah. And it has to do with... Um, the Elizabeth Short murder or the Black Dahlia murder, and it's a true story about this family, so it's fascinating. I would mm. definitely check it out. I shouldn't acknowledge this publicly and then very publicly, <laughs> um, but um, my wife got me into watching the the whole Dirty John thing, oh, and I, and seen that I couldn't yet. turn away once I started <laughs> watching it. And you'll see what I mean, I think. If you All start. right. Okay, Sandra, thank you very much. Thank I'm going to pass this over to Diana so she can walk us through news of the week, and not just the news of the week, but uh, tell us a little bit about the Hall of Fame 2019. Sure. So this week we revealed our 13 Hall of Fame 2019 honorees. Um, and uh, in case you are not aware, uh, the PR Week Hall of Fame honors leaders in the communications industry who challenge the status quo, move the needle in business, and strive to make a difference. So we did some really fun Q&As with the honorees. Um, we asked them about their biggest victories and fails, and also what they would do if they weren't in PR, and got some really interesting answers. Um, what like did they say? Tell us. Interior design, being a veterinarian, being a therapist. Um, so you can see that full list on our site. Um, I could do none of those things. <laughs> I could do none of them. Yeah. Could you see me as a therapist? Um, Isn't PR a form of therapy uh, in some ways? It's yeah. like corporate therapy. That's, a, that's so. a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I could see it. Okay. Yeah. I feel like you have the beard for it. Oh, I therapists yeah. have beards, do they? Yeah. I don't know. Do they? I don't know. Okay. Like All a right. little Freudian. Freud had a beard. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So tell us more about yeah. the Hall of Fame, please. Uh, sure. We, we um, talk about my beard far too much, I guess. I um, like sure. I mean, I don't more. really want to call out any particular... You don't have a favorite? Um, I do. Can I sure, call yeah. out to... I of saw course. my uh, good friend Maureen Lippy on that list, and I was very, very excited. We um, worked together. She actually really started the She Quality movement for... Mm -hmm the PR Council and does an amazing job in focusing on elevating women in the PR industry to the executive rank. So uh, I love the Hall of Fame every year when it comes out. I'm just so excited to see what incredible women are doing in the industry. So yeah, it's a great, yeah. great initiative. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's also, you know, Caroline Detman, uh, she's Golan's chief creative officer and she launched the Have Her Back initiative um, following in the footsteps of Me Too and Time's Up. Um, so, and that's with the goal of hiring, training, and empowering female creative directors. So there's a lot of really, um, you know, very impressive women on this list. And we also have um, the women to watch that we're honoring, um, and that's 28 women um, who are already setting the comms industry ablaze with innovative ideas that are helping to move PR forward. Um, so we're holding the Hall of Fame event on June 5th in New York City, so be there or be square. Be there or be square. Okay, and speaking of new chief creative officers or new creative yes. directors, uh, Burson and Conan Wolf has a new one in North America. Yep, uh, so Vincent Dente is the uh, it's a, it's a newly created role, created role of chief creative officer um, for North America, and he's reporting to Chris Foster, who's president of North America and global president Jim Joseph. Um, Dente started on February 27th, and he previously worked at MSL, where he was EVP and executive creative director for the U.S. for about six months. Okay. I have no lame segue this time, so I just want to <laughs> say, let's, let's talk for a minute about the Boeing crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is something that's, that's um, you know, being updated by the moment, that's changing by the moment. So, you, you know, this is something of a technology issue. 
What do you advise clients when they get in a situation, maybe not quite at this scale, where Boeing is this gigantic global company and it's dealing with all these different versions of the, the FAA in different com uh, countries, but what do you, what's your advice to technology companies when they get into something of a similar pickle to where Boeing is right you now? You know, it's, first of all, it's so tragic any, any time you have something like this happen or loss of life, and especially if it could potentially be associated with your company mm -hmm. or your technology. Um, we do a lot of crisis comms. We've actually worked uh, on many instances where there was loss of life or major injuries to people. Um, and it's uh, incredibly difficult. And there are a variety of, I guess, instincts that organizations have when something like this happens. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think they make the mistake of is if they immediately focus on how do we protect ourselves and our brand without just being human for a moment and recognizing the tragic events and having empathy and having um, sympathy for these families is not the same thing as an admission of guilt or culpability in an incident. Mm. And we always talk about you know, how you can react as a company by acknowledging what happened, acknowledging you know, the, the, the devastation that was caused and the impact to these poor people and their families, but separating that from your knowledge of any culpability from a technical or legal standpoint. And um, you know, this case with, with Boeing is even more complicated because um, they are not the ones who are operating the technology when, this, right. when these accidents happened. Um, and then you have uh, this strange kind of intervention of countries and governments who are grounding their planes um, and a late reaction from the FAA um, to grounding their planes. And then Boeing say, oh yes, we actually ag agreed with this recommendation. You know, I do think that Boeing could have gotten ahead of it and been the one to make the recommendation mm -hmm. um, and been the one to be at the forefront to say, you know, our utmost concern is passenger safety um, and wait until they had a full investigation before uh, recommending continued operation of their planes. So although yes, now they are behind the FAA and supporting their statement, I do think that that was an opportunity for them to do the right thing that they came late to. Right. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, uh, in events like this, consumers have a very short memory. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is not the first time, obviously there was the, the flight back in October uh, that crashed, but Boeing has had its planes grounded before. Um, they had an incident, I think it was back in 2013, where the Dreamliner was uh, grounded for uh, three months, if I'm not mistaken, when they had um, lithium ion batteries that were exploding mid flight. Um, so, they, you know, anyone who works in the airline industry should be ready and um, anticipate that a crisis will happen. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow, I did not see the kind of reaction I would expect to see from a company of this caliber. Do you think that it affects Boeing because simply there's just not that many companies that make airplanes. Well, their stock uh, lost, I think it was 11% in the first right. two days of this week. Right. They lost something like $26 billion in market valuation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they have about 5,000 of these planes on back order. So yes, it okay. can hurt them. Okay. Um, you know, they're still obviously one of the largest, if not the largest players in aviation. Um, but this absolutely could uh, have an extremely negative impact on them, not just from a reputation, but from a financial standpoint. Okay. Uh, I want to end on a slightly less somber note and uh, talk about Frito-Lay this week, Diana, <laughs> and tell us about um, chips garbage. and contents and uh, <laughs> things like that. Yes, chips and contents. That's uh, a great transition. Yeah. It's really, I'm working on them. I'm really, I'm really trying, and sometimes there's just no way. To, <laughs> there's uh, no way to do it. You just got to cut. <laughs> so, anyway, over to Frito-Lay. Yeah. A debate about chips is hard to transition to anyway from pretty much any topic. I'm just um, upset we don't have any. Here, so I, I was hoping we would true. taste test. Well, I'll tell you.
tell you a story that when I was a kid, I had a Frito sweatshirt and I wore it like once to school and I got made fun of and the kids called me Frito's Frank and I never wore it again. <laughs> That's, um, do you still have it? I might. That's amazing. My mom saves all kinds of things. So. Frito's Frank. <laughs> it was bright that? yellow. It was like that Frito's yellow. I think you needed to embrace logo. it. That's like... That's like a superhero persona, Frito's Frank, and you have a cake, <laughs> but like, I love yeah. it. Frank. Yeah. Um, did you have a dog named Frito? No, I didn't. Oh, I never okay. had a dog. Oh, okay. I'm, not okay. a, I'm not a dog person, as a lot of people know. Yeah. I know mean, you're a dog All person. About the cats. I, I am. I love dogs. Right. I'm not about the Well, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about this offline, <laughs> I, I suppose, I, is the uh, safest yeah. way to do it. I recently became a cat person. Um, I have a cat named Peanut. Uh, I was a dog person. So you have a plug for you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I yeah. do not do that on the air. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay. Anyway, um, tell us okay. about the free so, delay conference. Chips, chips debate. Um, so on Sunday, a social media influencer and comedian by the name of Kevin Fredericks, who is also known as Kev on Stage, posted a video on Twitter asking people for the correct way to rank a variety pack of chips. Um, they were all free delay brands. Um, so, um, the tweet kind of went viral and it became a huge debate on Twitter. Um, and Frito-Lay, I talked to their North America director of brand communications, Chris Yema, and he was very happy about the debate. He said it's a good challenge when many of their brands are top of mind for consumers. And in this what case, brands are they on again? So this was, um... Lay's, Doritos, Cheetos, uh, Fritos. Right. Uh, you remind so, me. So yeah. Um, so it was a huge debate. Uh, I think Which is your favorite? Also put a poll. I have to say I change my mind week to week. Really? I, some weeks I'm like Fritos are disgusting, and then the next week I love them. Uh, sometimes right. I love Doritos. It depends what mood I'm in. I sometimes yeah, it's it's very odd. I don't know. I can't stick to one kind. I don't like we Doritos. We have all of them in our kitchen here at PR Week. But, uh, I don't like Doritos. I don't like any kind of... You don't like of, any Doritos? No, I don't like any kind of chip where you, you sell over your fingers. I'm not sure that I can it. trust no. a person who doesn't like Doritos. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry because our podcast has already been recorded, so you have, you have no way out now. Um, anyway, I'm not a Doritos person. It's, it is sad that you can't dip any of these brands in hummus. Uh, sure you can. A, you can absolutely. Really you can that absolutely well. dip. I don't know. They make hummus. hummus now. Comes in all these flavors. Maybe you yeah. should like True. let the folks at Sabra know you want a Doritos <laughs> hummus like collaboration. Maybe that's the next Maybe. social media viral. Maybe idea. that's it. <laughs> We're starting it right now. Which which chip goes best with hummus? I think we should do a yeah. test. It's the best. Okay. Um, Sandra, thank you very much for coming on the podcast thank you. this, this week. Was we a appreciate, lot of fun. It. appreciate Diana, it. Diana, thank you for co hosting. Sean, thank you for being the man behind the dials. And we will see you next week again, this time for the PR Week. Thank you very much.